Good evening. I want to welcome all of you to this um, uh, lecture in our leadership lecture series featuring alumni. Today's talk is by Dr. Prakash Keshavaya. He's a BTEC mechanical from 1967. He is the director of the nephrology unit at the Himalayan Institute Hospital Trust and also honorary professor of physiology at Dehradun, Uttaranchal. I think you have all seen the bio that I have circulated and uh, I'm not going to go through his extensive list of accomplishments and awards and I'm sure you have all read the abstract that he had um, that, I, that he had circulated also which I think very clearly explains where he was and how he got to where he is today. So and since that's all the, also the topic of his talk I don't want to steal his thunder I'll let uh, Prakash tell you about it himself. Prakash. A very good evening to all of you. I'd like to thank Professor Nagarajan and the Office of Alumni Affairs for making this visit possible and for giving me the opportunity to give this talk. It's been almost seven years since I was last here. Uh, batch, the 67 batch, had its Ruby reunion in 2007. And yesterday I had an opportunity to see if the tree that we planted was still alive. It's alive and it's about nine feet tall, so that's good. A little bit about my the topic. Um, I was the fourth batch of IIT Madras, and at that time, campus times had become a very... Uh, not only was it topical, it was interesting, a lot of humor, a lot of poetry, and I was a contributor to Campus Times. I used the pen name Lumiere, which in French means light, and Prakash also means light, so that was my pen name. And without spending too much time about the five years at IIT, I would like to move on, but I just would like to say that those five years were very good years of my life. I first arrived in 1962 at Narmada Hostel. The hostel was not ready at that time. And I foolishly took up the offer of a friend of mine who stayed at Krishna, a year senior to me. He said, come and spend a couple of days in Krishna. And there were seniors who were trolling the hallways looking for freshers to rag. So I had to do a lot of singing and dancing. But one thing I did uh, not get to do was uh, having to jog around the campus in my underwear in the moonlight. I missed, fortunately missed out on that. But I had everything else. Uh, um, we had a good time at Narmada. We had a group of friends who had a wide range of interests. We could talk about the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. We could also talk about uncertainties of how to get to know members of the fairer sex. We had some uh, interesting episodes. We had a friend, Madhavan. One day his room was open. We found a goat wandering around. We fed it a lot of water and locked it up in Madhavan's room. When Madhavan entered the room, the goat charged him. He fell into a puddle of urine and after that his name was Madhavan. <laughs> Interestingly, in Madras, on, in that batch, we had about 12 Sardars come from North India, from Punjab and Haryana and Delhi to be a part of our batch. And uh, Sardars don't have much use for shaving cream. But one morning, one of the Sardars was foaming at the mouth. Somebody had taken his toothpaste tube and squeezed some shaving cream into it. <laughs> so yeah, we had Sardar foaming at the mouth. Nowadays, there's a a sophisticated form of surgery called keyhole surgery. They make three small incisions and they can remove your gallbladder, they can remove your kidney with, min it's called minimally invasive surgery. I think the precursor to that was some of my classmates at Narmada. They used mosquito rods and through the window of a room, they could rearrange all the furniture in the room and all the belongings. <laughs> so the precursors to keyhole technology was already there at Narmada. These were five good years. They were simple years. We did not have a lot of sophistication in our, uh, uh, in terms of the pastimes we had. The common room only had a carom board, table tennis table. This was pre-TV, pre-internet, pre, -TV, pre, -internet, pre -v 
um, you know, having uh, all these video games and so on. So it was a simple life, but it was a fun life. We had a lot of memorable times. I had uh, mentioned in my talk in about profession, passion, and purpose. So I'll first get to profession. I've already talked about, oh, one thing I must say about academics. The academics, and at that time, BTEC was a five-year program. And every Friday evening at 5 p.m., the clerk would announce the next day's three periodicals. So immediately, people would rush off to their rooms to cram for the three periodicals. And we had five such periodicals in each subject. So it was a very arduous, very stringent program. And I still remember the warden's hostels were opposite Narmada. And I would watch the lights go off one by one from 10 p.m. to 11 p.m the entire warden's colony would grow dark and we still had hours and hours before we could go to sleep. So I used to envy the wardens and their uh, getting more than 40 winks. And we were held back even if we failed in one subject, even a subject like German. We had somebody held back for a whole year because they failed in German. And uh, talking about German reminds me of uh, Professor Klein was a German professor. And he happened to go on vacation. So they deputed Frau Inge Srinivasan from Max Müller Bauern to come and teach us for a week. Uh, Frau Inge would wear a mini skirt, would hop onto the table to teach. And after seeing that, all of our classmates cut all other classes, all sections would show up in the German class. <laughs> so German became a, a very popular subject. In terms of profession, my first job was at Larsen de Tubro in Pawai. It was a, after four screening, uh, written test, two interviews, a debate, finally was selected into the apprentice engineer program. It's a three year program. And so that was my first start of my profession. It was when I got to the University of Minnesota that I was exposed to research and that became my passion. And now, that I'm at the Himalayan Institute Hospital Trust located between Rishikesh and Dehradun, I'm able to see a little more about purpose of life and I'd like to sort of lead you through my journey. I was, uh, I've been here for 16 years. I came here and that should actually be 1998, not 88. I was recruited for Lasting Tubro from campus interviews and a written test. I was put as a chargeman in charge of skilled fabricators. They were skilled uh, welders and sheet metal workers. And they knew that though you're from IIT, you're a greenhorn, you don't know anything about fabrication. So they'd bring a lot of imaginary problems for you to solve, just to test you. Fortunately, my knowledge of trigonometry came in handy. I saw that they had to do very complicated cutouts for milk tankers and bottling machines. And I showed them how with simple trigonometry you could uh, make the job of drawing up these cutouts much easier. And so I was able to win some respect from these uh, fabricators. I was rotated through various other shops. But the 14 months that I spent in Lassen and Tubro made me introspect about life, about purpose. While I was very grateful to have received a great career opportunity at the time of industrial recession, I realized how much I missed the hostel and my friends in the hostel. It was a lonely life in Mumbai. Mumbai was a concrete jungle. I missed the greenery of the IIT campus. When you have it, you hardly notice it. But when you don't have it, you really miss it. I learned to get used to working shift duties, but that added to the loneliness because by the time you got up after a late evening shift, there was nobody around. And eating out alone, is a pitch. I mean, really, you need to eat with company to enjoy the food. But being in Bombay alone, away from the hostel, away from home cooked meals, made me introspect and I realized that I was not cut out for the industrial workplace, for an industrial career. I realized that I missed academics and scholastic pursuits. I missed home and friends. And I realized that nature being exposed to greenery, being exposed to sunshine, to beautiful sunrises and sunsets was very important for 
mental well-being as well. Through the role of Providence, I managed to get some application forms and headed off with $8 in my pocket to the University of Minnesota. This is one of the, the Northrop Auditorium, the mall of the University of Minnesota. I enrolled for a master's in mechanical engineering, studied fluid mechanics, heat transfer, thermodynamics. And it normally takes about six quarters to complete a master's, but because of financial constraints, I completed it in four quarters by taking a fairly heavy load. I was fortunate to get a half-time research assistantship in a bioengineering laboratory. And again, Providence was there. I had gone to the university to study solar energy, to do research in the area of solar energy, but I ended up in artificial organs instead. Professor Blackshear was a mentor, a great mentor, a visionary. He had money for a left ventricular assist device, the left heart. And I started my PhD in biomedical engineering, working on the artificial heart. I was also fortunate to, while still a student, to go to an international conference. I had not even presented at a local conference, so it was baptism by fire to go to Melbourne and present a paper on my PhD research. But one thing that did happen on this visit to Melbourne was that I stopped off in Delhi. I had been writing to a young lady and her father permitted me to go out with her that evening. We went to India Gate in Delhi and we supposedly went boating but my wife to this day says that all we did was splash the water around, we hardly moved. We sat and talked for a while and decided to get married that evening and uh, a few weeks later we got married. I headed off to the conference in Australia, came back a week later and both my bride and I left for Minnesota to continue my studies as a graduate student in a PhD program. My thesis was presented in 74. That was also when we were expecting our first child. So it was a race to the finish between my thesis and my wife giving birth. I, my thesis won by a whisker. I think by a few weeks I completed my thesis before our son Mayank arrived on the scene. I studied red cell destruction and looked at how fluid mechanics influences the destruction of red blood cells in artificial organs. In those days, any patient who got a heart valve implanted became anemic soon after. So we looked at how fluid shear stresses affect red cell destruction. And there was a lot of math involved also and modeling. We did some computational fluid mechanics as well. So it was an interesting time for me. This is the student building, the student union called the Kaufman Union at the University of Minnesota. I was walking through campus one day and I saw a poster saying that a monk from the Himalayas was going to be giving a lecture on how monks are trained in Himalayan monasteries. I thought that was an interesting topic and so I decided to attend the lecture. It was in November of 70, 1970, I'm sorry, 69. The monk was Swami Rama and meeting him over a period of a year was a great turning point in my life and though I had found my passion and research, the purpose was to come later through the mentorship. He was my friend, philosopher and guide and it was through his graciousness that I've been able to come back to India and participate in the charitable hospital and medical college that he has created. He was a diamond of many facets. He went to the Manager Foundation in Kansas and under controlled conditions, he showed that he could control his blood flow, his heart, his brain waves. He even moved an object a few feet away purely by his mind control in spite of having to put on a welder's mask and all the rooms, all the windows were closed and he could move an, an object five feet away. The first time he did it, they said it was a fluke. They asked him to repeat it and he was able to do it again. The scientists were afraid to publish this research, being peer-reviewed, they thought that they would lose their credibility, but these were the amazing things that he was capable of. And when asked how he did it, he said that the main thing is to show that it's within human potential to do these things. It's not that each one of you has to learn to do these things, but once the mental barrier is broken, then other humans will follow. 
which reminds me that the four minute mile was not broken for years and people thought that the anatomy of the body and the physiology was such that one could not run the mile in less than four minutes till a medical student called Bannister ran the mile in less than four minutes and now every high school athlete runs a mile in less than four minutes. For centuries nobody had climbed Mount Everest till Tenzing Norgay and Edmund Hillary climbed Mount Everest. Now a blind person has climbed Mount Everest. A person with a prosthetic leg has climbed Mount Everest. So more of a physical barrier, it's a mental barrier. And once a mental barrier is broken, others can follow suit. So Swami so, Rama showed what was possible for human beings to achieve once they learned to control their minds. So he came to the United States to be a bridge between science and spirituality. And he founded the Himalayan Institute of Yoga Science and Philosophy. More than all of these powers that he had, what attracted me was his compassion, his humanness, and the fact that he had a big heart with no expectation. He has written over 45 books on varied topics. And through his work, new paradigms have been established for understanding psychosomatic disorders. That is, psycho is the brain, the mind, soma is the body. So how bodily ailments are caused by negative thinking, by depression, by stress, and so on. He founded the Himalayan International Trust in Dehradun. In Pennsylvania, he founded the International Institute, 400 acres, a beautiful place, and he trained many American yogis, he trained scientists, he trained uh, philosophers, doctors, and they've all started now using yoga therapy in their therapeutic regimen. I mentioned the control of blood flow, the control of the heart, brain waves. He could raise a tumor on his forearm, have people biopsy to show it was a cancerous tumor, and then he could dissolve it before their very eyes. These are some of the scientific work showing the temperature difference of 10 degrees that he created between just a, two parts of the palm, just about an inch and a half apart. And this is when he went into atrial fibrillation by increasing heart rate to 300 beats a minute. Uh, later, a cardiologist was shown these tracings and he said, could you save this patient? And Dr. Green, the leader of the group said, well, we removed all the probes on his body and he gave an afternoon lecture that day. So that's the kind of skill he had. Learning in the U.S. was a tremendous experience for me. What did I learn from going to graduate school in the U.S.? Well, the stringent training, all the periodicals, all the open book tests, after that, studies in the U.S. was a piece of cake. It wasn't difficult, which left time for partying and dating and so on. But after a while, I realized that there was a lot of game playing, role playing, and pretenses involved in all of this. I realized the strength of my cultural roots and traditions. And I fortunately had a safety net through meditation and the mentorship of Swami Rama. But I was impressed by American college students. They left home at the age of 18. They worked jobs. They cleaned, they washed ditches, dishes. They were waitresses or waiters. They cleaned laundromats. And they earned not only the livelihood, but they paid their college education. Because they paid for their own college education, they were very serious about their studies. I've been teaching undergraduates now where I am. And they come from affluent families and they don't have to work for their studies. And they're much more apathetic about their studies than the American students who had to work for their tuition. I was also very inspired by the American ethos of hard work, pride of workmanship. They really took a lot of effort to be perfect in what they did. And the system's approach to problem solving. I was there in the late 60s, early 70s. This was the time of the Vietnam War. I also got involved in a lot of anti-Vietnam protests and demonstrations. But I realized after a while that these students who were protesting the war in Vietnam had very little peace in their own lives. They were talking about world peace, but they were fighting with their parents, with their siblings. So I realized that there was some hypocrisy involved in trying to strive for world peace when you didn't have peace within your own heart. 
Fortunately, though I experimented with alcohol and other drugs, I did not succumb to any of these addictions and uh, meditation became a much safer way for altered states of mind. As I said, I got married while still a graduate student. I found that on a half-time assistantship, my wife could not take up a job as it was a dependent visa being on a student visa myself. So we had to manage on very limited finances. Even to go out for a pizza became a major financial decision. I had an old car that kept breaking down and that was a drain of the money till I sold it. And my poor wife who had had a good life in Delhi had to be cooped up in a small studio apartment in the middle of the Minnesota winter. And the only shopping she could do was either window shopping or grocery shopping. So it wasn't a very good first few years of marriage, but uh, it was still a good time in spite of all the sacrifices. But I decided to leave the university to improve our finances even before I completed my thesis. I completed all my experimental work and then went on to write my thesis at home. I joined the regional kidney disease program of the Hennepin County Medical Center. Again, Providence plays a role in such things. My advisor, PhD advisor, was on a flight coming in from Washington, D.C., and beside him was the head of the kidney disease program. They started talking to each other, and Dr. Shapiro, the head of the kidney program, said, we need somebody with an engineering mind to help us in dialysis research. So Perry Blackshear, my advisor, came back and said, you have an interview with a nephrologist on Monday. I had to go and look up a dictionary to see what nephrologist meant. I didn't know what a nephrologist was. I found out the nephrologist is a kidney specialist, so I went for an interview at the kidney disease program. They hired me right away, and uh, the next 15 years of my life was a tremendous uh, period where research became very much a part of my life. It was very exciting to collaborate with clinicians First, I started with bench research aimed at improving equipment used in dialysis. Then I went on to do animal research. At that time, patients on dialysis had a lot of symptoms. During their, at that time, dialysis lasted almost nine hours, three times a week. They would throw up, they would vomit, they would have dizziness, they would have cramps, they would have headaches, their blood pressure would stop suddenly, would drop suddenly. So they had a lot of symptoms during dialysis. So we studied in animal experiments what was causing these problems. And then we found that we could extrapolate from animal experiments to humans. And this led to much more efficient dialysis and less symptoms during dialysis. I also was involved in training nurses and technicians and uh, fellows in the nephrology program. I was fortunate in being able to publish a number of papers, write some textbook chapters, and go to a number of international conferences. At that time, we were blessed with a son, Mayank, who came just a few weeks after the thesis was complete, and our daughter, Aparna, two years later. We had to leave them both behind in the US when we came back to India. This is, I had a, a joint appointment, both at the county hospital and at the University of Minnesota Medical School. This shows some of the, the schematic of the animal experiments and some of the results. We were able to put catheters into the heart of the dog. We were able to measure the cardiac output during the dialysis. We were able to uh, draw samples of the spinal fluid of the blood and look at the blood-brain barrier diffusion. We were looking at what happened to the total peripheral resistance. So all of this helped us improve dialysis and make it less symptomatic. And fortunately, that led to a master's uh, thesis in physiology. So in addition to my engineering background, I managed to also complete a degree in physiology. What did I learn about the research environment in the US? It is a meritocracy. But if you're an immigrant, you do have to work harder. Though it's not racial discrimination, it's just the fact that they can't pronounce your name they don't really know what's your background like. So you have to prove that you can achieve at the same level that they do, but you have to work a lot harder and achieve a lot more to get the recognition. It was very exciting for an engineer to work in a medical setting with clinicians. 
and I would really urge many of you who are still wondering about what to do for your MTech that biomedical engineering is a very fertile area and electronics engineers, electrical engineers, mechanical engineers, chemical engineers, you all have roles in solving medical problems. While medicine can also provide a human face, what I lacked in Larsen and Tubro was a human face to what I was doing. And being in the medical field, working with patients gave that human face. And technology is always a springboard for advances in medicine. The CAT scanner, MRIs, they're all based on physics, on engineering principles, electronics. But I would like to emphasize this, communication skills are very important. Unless you can communicate your research, unless you can discuss, answer questions at a conference, do so with confidence of your abilities to communicate. And when you teach, you know the level of the audience and you pitch at that level. So communication is very important. These you think are soft skills were extremely important. So I would say please don't ignore soft skills in your engineering training. They'll stand you in good stead in the future. I had great mentors with great vision, both uh, Professor Blackshear at the university and Dr. Shapiro gave me a lot of freedom and they really helped me in my career. One plus one can be two, but one plus one can also be 11. And it all depends on how you want to make of it. There's a Persian saying, Mohabbat ke karine par aadha pehla karina hai. On the ladder of love, respect is the first rung. So learning to respect your spouse Whenever Swami Rama would see my wife and me, he would ask me, are you being a typical Indian husband or are you being a good husband? <laughs> so through his mentorship, I learned to help out with the duties around the home. And the thing about living in the U.S. is you have to do everything yourself. You can't really afford a lot of household help that we have in India. You learn how to mow the lawn, shovel the driveway, fix leaks in your plumbing. So those are other things that you learn. Raising kids is a challenge because they have the peers who give them certain values and they've got the parents who give them sometimes diametrically opposed values. So how do you bridge the gap between the values of the parents and the peers? Children go through a lot of uh, you know, heart-rending thinking about this. So there has to be skill in resolving this conflict and values. But children have a tremendous milieu for improving the talents in other directions. Our children learn to ski, to skate, to play the piano, to swim. To, my daughter became a very good Bharatanatyam dancer. So they have a tremendous outlet for other skills and other pursuits besides academics. And one should be open to children pursuing non-traditional paths. My wife is a computer analyst, I'm a scientist. My son started as a stock analyst in New York. Then he became a dot-com entrepreneur. Then he became a school teacher in inner city school in Washington, D.C. Now he's a writer, he's a playwright in Los Angeles, trying to write plays. And he's been reasonably successful at it. He had a play produced off-Broadway about a year and a half ago. So you should be open and not suppress your children in exploring other avenues for their growth. After 15 years in the academic setting, I felt that I needed to challenge myself, learn something new. So I decided to go into the corporate environment. I joined a healthcare company, Baxter Healthcare. It's a multi-billion dollar company. And those were the headquarters in Deerfield, Chicago. Though they're based in Chicago, I convinced them that having a research lab in a clinical setting was advantageous, so they allowed me to set up a clinical engineering laboratory in Minneapolis itself. I started in research and advanced development, built a skilled team of engineers. We developed a lot of concepts for advanced products. We got a number of patents in a matter of three years. We had about nine patents that were awarded. And Later, when I became a vice president of product development, I was able to supervise four development teams advanced in Minneapolis, 
disposables in Chicago, hardware in Tampa, and Japanese market products in Tokyo. So this is another new learning experience for me in the corporate environment. But after a while, I grew tired of the corporate environment. Uh, studies showed that an uh, engineer in the corporate environment spends 60% of the time in meetings and writing reports. They have less than 40% of the time to actually do some engineering. So after a while, it became a dull environment. Fortunately, uh, Swami Rama had started a campus between Dehradun and Rishikesh. He has an aerial view of the Himalayan Institute Hospital Trust campus. It's about 200 acres surrounded by the foothills of the Himalayas. It's a beautiful place, a very clean, green, and serene campus. My respect for nature and my love of nature has been, again, reinforced by being in this environment. We have a 750-bed hospital, multi-specialty hospital, and a medical college for both undergraduate and postgraduate studies. We have nursing college, paramedical, and now we have added engineering streams, management, computer science, and we have become a university. This is the dialysis unit. With my American uh, way of thinking, I thought starting a dialysis unit in India should be easy. Maybe six months, four to six months. It took me 12 to 14 months. Uh, the people of Gadwal in the hills, hills don't move, nor do the Gadwalis. If they can do something tomorrow, why do it today? They're very easy going, like the, like the people in the Caribbean, like in Jamaica. Why, why worry about it, man? Do it tomorrow. So it was a very casual attitude. I hardly knew any Hindi at that time. I get words like intazam, intahan, all mixed up. Uh, but I had to communicate with plumbers, with carpenters, with welders to create this dialysis unit. I learned Hindi on the go. And we now have a fairly productive dialysis unit, the largest in the whole state. We do 1,000 hemodialysis treatments every month. We have done about 20 kidney transplants. And if you look at our campus, it's surrounded by sugarcane fields and rice fields. It's a rural area. And yet, something like this has been possible. It's a non-profit charitable trust. And uh, though I should have consulted my wife on the flight from the U.S. to India to take up this, I decided that I didn't want to earn a livelihood in India and that whatever we did, we would do it out of our own savings. Fortunately, it's been 16 years and we've still been able to eke out a livelihood, a simple one. Uh, I also have taught physiology in the medical school. But the best thing is I've been able to do a diverse array of projects. Besides the dialysis and the physiology, I've been able to work on uh, technology-related projects like campus-wide Wi-Fi. We have a 200-acre campus. We have put up 16 Wi-Fi towers, and everyone in the hostels, in all the departments in the hospital can use Wi-Fi. We have smart classrooms, so the lecturer does not have to turn his back to the audience, can face the audience right on a screen on the podium and the LCD projector projects the writing. They can show slides, annotate the slides, so smart classrooms. And the best thing is we have a rural development institute. We have adopted 1,200 villages. We do healthcare, education, skill development, and water and sanitation projects. I recently came from a project where we the mountain stream was 300 meters below the village. The village was above. And the women had to trudge four hours to six hours a day to fetch water. Uh, we put up 50 solar panels that could power a DC motor and a pump, three horsepower motor that could lift the water 300 meters. And we created a 6,000 liter tank with four taps. Now the village just walk up to the tank, turn on a faucet and they have the water for their livelihood, for their uh, families, for their livestock. And the four hours that they save, they can now do other things and we teach them livelihood skills. I've also been fortunate to be able to look at the risk factors for kidney disease in rural populations. Even in a rural population, diabetes, 
high blood pressure are risk factors. I've also been fortunate to get into administration and finance and be on the governing body of the trust. What I've learned from doing this for the last 16 years is that it's better to give than to receive. You get a tremendous amount of fulfillment from being less selfish. Serving your fellow men is more meaningful than performing a lot of religious rites in temples. Swami Rama used to quote from one of the Upanishads, Deho Devalaya, Deho Devalaya, uh, no, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm sorry, I'll, I'll uh, give you the English. It says that the human body is a shrine of the divine, and the deity of the shrine is Atma, and it's better to serve your fellow men than to go to temples and mosques and churches and do a lot of religious worship. Deho Devalaya Prokta Jiva Devo Sanatana. So Jiva is the deity, the Atma, and Devalaya, the shrine, is the human body itself. So social entrepreneurship, one of the reasons I contacted Professor Nagarajan is to look at what sort of projects one could do in terms of social entrepreneurship. And I'm amazed to see how much is going on at IIT Madras. The problem we face in India is that the chasm between the affluent and the poor is very large. In Japan, the wealthiest makes about 12 times the poorest. In India, it's probably 1,200 or 12,000 times. So when you have such a large gap between the very rich and the very poor, there's bound to be a lot of chaos in society. And I think the reason why the Aam Admi Party has made such a dent is because of this big gap. What we see is that there's a need for the trickle-down effect for wealth to start trickling down to the lower levels. And in India, some of the areas we see in rural areas are malnutrition in children, stunted growth, low birth weights, inadequate immunization in most villages. 30% of the children may be immunized, or those who are immunized don't get the full range of immunizations. There's a lot of maternal mortality. About 100,000 women die each year, either during childbirth or during pregnancy. And we created a simple kit, costs about 10 rupees. All it has is, it has got a toothpick for the midwife to scrape away the dirt from her nails. It's got a small bar of soap for the midwife to wash her hands before the delivery. It's got a clean, brand new blade to cut the umbilical cord. It's got a piece of clean thread to tie off the umbilicus and some gauze. This costs about 10 rupees, but it can save a mother's life from septic complications of unhygienic delivery. Because in many villages, the delivery takes place in the cow shed. And a sickle is used to cut the umbilical cord. So it's amazing that in a country where we say India is shining, that there are such disparities. So maternal mortality as well as mortality among young children below the age of five. For simple things like, you know, because of the open defecation, there's a lot of diarrheal disease. And the children lose a lot of fluid through the diarrhea. They develop multi-organ failure, kidney failure, multi-organ failure, and they could die. Whereas all you need is a simple salt solution with a little sugar mixed in. And you just drink liters of this and you're fine. But they don't have the knowledge and they don't have these packets of these oral replacement solutions readily available. But they can avoid a lot of deaths because of diarrhea. And literacy, we know that uh, big pockets, when they talk about the Bimaru states, Bihar, for example, Rajasthan, Madhya Pradesh, Uttar Pradesh. So there's a low literacy, especially among the women. If you educate a woman, you educate a whole family. So I think these are some of the things that Returning India has taught me that these are the needs that need to be addressed. What is the purpose? I talked about purpose. Happiness is the ratio of what you have to what you need. You can either increase the numerator or you can decrease the denominator. Increasing the numerator is difficult. With all the malls we have in India, there are so many thousands of products and after you get tired of one product, you crave another. So it's an unending story. But if you start simplifying your needs, decrease the denominator, then your quantum of happiness can increase in a much safer way. 
So while basic needs may need to be satisfied, we have to draw the line and not get caught up in extravagant consumerism. Unfortunately, the malls of Gurgaon have made extravagant consumerism. People spend 10,000 rupees for a pair of shoes. I mean, I can't, you can buy a pair of Bata shoes for 899. I mean, 899, why do you have to spend 10,000 rupees? Uh, happiness, pursuit of wealth, pursuit of name and fame, ultimately, you find it empty. You wonder, is this all there is to it? So happiness is more of an inner state, good health, peace of mind, contentment. These are great treasures. The Dalai Lama was asked once in Colorado, what is the meaning of life? He said, oh, that's an easy question. The meaning of life is to be happy. But what is a hard question, he said, is what makes for happiness? For some, it's money. For some, it's a big house. For some, it's accomplishment. For others, it's company of friends. But he said, ultimately, you'll realize that happiness comes from compassion and a good heart. He said, that makes true happiness. And another last quotation from the Dalai Lama. When asked what surprised him most about humanity, he said, mankind, because he sacrifices his health to make money, then sacrifices money to recover his health, anxious about the future, does not enjoy the present. The result being, he does not live in the present or in the future. He lives as if he is never going to die and dies never having really lived. So this is what amazed the Dalai Lama about humanity. Thank you very much for a kind hearing. I am open for questions if you have any or any comments as well. Absolutely. Sure. Thank you. I will. Hello, sir. Yeah. Uh, which one? The, about uh, you, uh, right. Uh huh. Right. I see, I see. He had ready answers for everything between people who gave complicated answers. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Also, that was from Barbara Waters' interview with the Dalai Lama. He gave that uh, whole write-up again. Uh, thank you for that source. To be honest, uh, somebody pasted it on a Facebook page and that's how I got it. <laughs> Sir, engineering and medical, they are like uh, completely different fields. So was it difficult for you to transition from one to the other? And what was your motivation? Okay. Uh, throughout my engineering, just being with machines, with formulae, with equations, I felt that there was a human element missing. And the opportunity to work on a medical problem gave that human face to what I was doing. It actually was not difficult. In fact, when I started studying physiology, it was very exciting because the principles, it was not rocket science. Physiology is a physics of biology and it's very elementary physics. But to understand how a muscle contracts about the calcium fluxes through the membrane, to understand how red cells can squeeze into very narrow capillaries to find out that the bone marrow can make a perfect disc with eight plus or minus half a micron with exactly the right amount of hemoglobin groups. All this was fascinating. When I looked at how the kidney was uh, functioning and to see that the kidney filters a tremendous amount of water, but it returns 99% of the water back through the tubules and it's smart enough to know what to put back and what to excrete in the urine. So the smartness of the kidney, our machines are not that smart. Machines don't know what to do unless you program them with artificial intelligence. And machines don't repair themselves. What I found was in the human body, 
they not only know what to do they can distinguish a toxic molecule from a necessary molecule they retain the amino acids they retain the protein the sugar the water but they throw away the urea the creatinine the uric acid the phosphate so i said this is a very bright membrane this is the tubular membrane so i studied the fluxes and all the physics was very simple so actually it was a great revelation to me what you would call intelligent design of the body of nature and it was very fascinating and if you know engineering physiology and medicine become much easier i'm not trying to be a surgeon and learn surgical skills i was learning physiology i was learning what makes uh, the kidney work what makes a heart beat and so on so that was all a lot of physics involved in these things so it wasn't a difficult transition and a very fascinating one yes sir He was a uh, got that scholarship, um, British uh, Aerospace. Uh, what is it called? Uh, uh, Rolls Royce scholarship to go I to see. London. He did engineering there. Went to MIT and did PhD. Became a very good engineer. After ten years, he went into medicine. Today he is a practicing <laughs> surgeon in US. So up to forty years he was uh, an engineer. After uh -huh. forty, he is uh -huh. a uh, you are. Uh, you are still doing applied engineering. Right. He has right. done full. <laughs> He's now changed over totally to medicine. Amazing. Amazing. And uh, when you do this medical, biomedical engineering, most of us wonder, most of the ideas of remote robotic control we get, ideas come from the way we move our hands. Mm -hmm. uh, even the control engineering when right. we are taught. The myogenic arm. Yes, yes. The control engineering when you are taught, mm -hmm. the professor used to tell us how easy for you to take something, but if you have to implement it, say with a, uh, to take um, isotope or something with a remote handle, how much of the complex control system is required? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Just like picking something. When you have some problem on the brain, you will see how difficult it is for the hand to move according to the wish you give, uh, the command you give. Yeah. So, in, in fact, lot I of engineering, uh, you know, right. body is a great engineering marvel, I would say. I know an inventor in New Hampshire was very well known. In fact, the vehicle called the Segway was his invention. He designed a myogenic arm. And he said the most difficult thing was to be able to control the grasping. And he used an egg as a model. And it took, he had to break many eggs before he had an omelette because the pressure that was being applied was too great. But now he's got a myogenic arm that works beautifully. And uh, it can grasp things. People can paint with that myogenic arm and exquisite controls of fingers and so on. So, yes, sir. I ate Madras as well as in US and back in uh, Himalayas. Mm -hmm. What are the, some of the collaborative stuff that uh, IIT guys in the biosciences and maybe uh, the electrical, mechanical guys can do? So, they can give me a, give some thoughts on that. Yeah, there are many, many problems in medicine that yield to engineering principles and mathematical formulae. For example, heart rate variability. People are using chaos theory for solving uh, problems related to heart rate variability. So, uh, you know, the uh, CAT scan tomography was done by a physicist who learned how to take slices and then create three-dimensional images and to be able to rotate these things. Uh, when I work with ultrasound, for example, now the 3D ultrasound machines that are being sold today are so sophisticated that they can produce images of small tissues, in, uh, swelling of sm uh, tissues in the body. They can pick up tiny gravel in your gallbladder. And all of this is just sound having echoes. So I think uh, a lot of these, uh, it's all physics and engineering. And there are many, many problems that can be addressed. But in India, still bioengineering is in its infancy. When we started our engineering college recently, I wanted to have bioengineering. But they said not at the bachelor's level. In India, bioengineering is only at the master's level. So I think we had to wait till we graduate our first batch before we can start bioengineering. So we have set up a collaborative MOU with IIT Roorkee, which is nearby. And uh, some of their students have come and done PhD projects with our uh, mentors from the medical field. So there are lots of problems. 
and electrical, electronics, mechanical engineering, chemical engineering, biomaterials, all of these. In fact, I was at the biotech lab and we use blood tubing, we use PVC tubing to bring the blood to the artificial kidney. To make it flexible, they add DHP, diethyl hexyl phthalate, which is a plasticizer. It's toxic. It builds up in the gray matter of the brain. It builds up in the liver. And so patients who have been on dialysis for 8 and 10 years, they have a lot of plasticizer in the body. They become very flexible, I guess. <laughs> but it's not good for them. It's toxic. So you need better biomaterials. So it's a tremendous uh, learning what causes blood to clot when exposed to an artificial surface. It's a very challenging thing and there's a lot of chemistry involved there. So I think there's a whole uh, you know, universe of ideas that can be applied to medical problems. So we are going to have an MOU also. Yes, I was very... Yes, sir. What are your thoughts on uh, embryonic stem cell therapy, sir? I think it's an extremely um, exciting and you don't even now need embryonic stem cells. They're finding that skin cells can be used and using certain um, chemicals you can make them revert to becoming stem cells to the precursor stage. And uh, they've been able to grow like the tubule of the kidney in one place in Michigan, they've been able to grow tubular epithelial cells using stem cells. So I think in the next probably two decades, uh, transplantation of liver and kidney will not depend on donors, either living donors or cadaveric donors, but will be able to grow solid organs that perform like the real one. So you hear now about face transplants, you hear about so many, so all these will, will be able to grow and the same thing that you use in engineering, you know, the 3D printers, 3D printing will be used with the right media, cellular glues and so on, to create solid organs. So I think it's a very exciting field and uh, the fact that you don't have to use fetal blood and embryos, but can do it by reverting developed cells to a precursor stage of becoming stem cells is also a very exciting thing. So it's a great new future, I think. Thank you very much.